Welcome to Shidduch University, Shidduch U from Azayad. Hello, I'm Deborah Krasniansky, and in this series, I invite experts and professionals to talk about all aspects related to Shidduch dating. Today, we're talking about boundaries and dating with Alana Chasser. When we talk about boundaries and dating, we're talking about balance and respect, and we unpack all that in this conversation. Alana shares five types of boundaries that may come up in dating, what respecting boundaries looks like, and what crossing might feel like. And sometimes it's very nuanced. Enjoy this episode. Before we get started, I want to thank Rachama Klatman from Mask Parents for being part of this series and introducing me to Alana. Mask is a mental health support organization in their 26th year, providing programs, awareness, a radio show, and a helpline. And you can find them on the web at maskparents.org. And you can call them confidentially at 718-758 0400. And here is the episode. Hi, Alana. I'm so excited about this topic. I get so many questions about boundaries or is this, a, is this a question? Did he cross a boundary? Did she cross a boundary? So I'm really so excited that we're going to be actually talking about this and really unpacking it. What are boundaries? What is crossing a boundary? What is keeping within a boundary? So let's really unpack that. But before we even get started, can you talk a little about the work that you do in general and specifically why I asked you to talk about boundaries. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you to Ruchama Klatman, who also con connected us for me to be here. So I really am honored to be here to speak. I'm a clinical social worker. I've been in practice for 30 years. I work specifically, I'm in private practice for 20 years. And in the last 10, I'm specializing, focusing specifically on sexual addiction treatment. I work with partners who are betrayed partners of sexual addiction, recovering addicts, and couples, the three prongs of how that addiction affects people. That's mostly what I'm dealing with, working with now. So why well, I asked you to talk about boundaries in general, not only crossing those boundaries, but let's talk about boundaries. So when we talk about, when we just say boundaries, what do we even mean when we say those words, respecting but boundaries? Right. Boundaries is a very broad term. People use it a lot in different ways. But when we're talking about it in terms of relationships and dating, we're talking about balance. It's really talking about balance. Anything in extreme, over, under, too much, too little, isn't in balance. So we're looking for like a middle range. And what does that mean? So anything that's um, really anything that's that's out of balance will cause us to suffer. Food, money, sex relationships, anything. Torah teaches us that. Society teaches us that. If people didn't stop at so stop signs, we wouldn't be able to drive. So we really need boundaries everywhere in order to be safe. Boundaries are what keep us safe. So when we're talking about boundaries in this topic, we're talking about specifically shidduchim. So let's talk about what boundaries would look like in dating specifically. I know there's a whole other topic about what boundaries might look like in a marriage or even in friendships, but let's talk about as we're building a relationship or we're getting to know each other, what would boundaries look like in dating? Okay, so important to know what you're looking for in dating because you're looking to build a future. So it, there are different areas that we'll talk about um, and what to look for and to know what you're seeing when it shows up. I would break it down into five categories, but they're fluid and they're not linear. Verbal, emotional, physical, behavioral, and relational. These are different areas of boundaries. As you're getting to know somebody, you'd want to pay attention to how they show up in that process. So let's just say those again. We said verbal, emotional. Verbal boundaries, emotional, physical, relational, and behavioral, like people's actions. And we'll unpack all of those. We will unpack all of those. All right. <laughs> so we can start with verbal boundaries. As you're starting to get to know somebody, you're starting to interact, you're talking, you're getting to know not just not just what you're talking about, but how. So you wanna pay attention to both. What are people saying? How are they saying it? What are they omitting? Are they listening? We wanna be able to have more, look for more mutual sharing, to be able to talk and to be heard, to be able to listen and to speak. It is when it's more mutual. Out of boundaries would be someone is monopolizing someone doesn't share, the other person is oversharing, or it seems like oversharing. It might not be with someone else, but it might seem like oversharing if the other person isn't 
mutually sharing. So it can become lopsided. Sharing something, let's say you tell someone you have an interview tomorrow, you'd want them to follow up, right? Are they listening? Are they paying attention to what you what what you're saying and how you're sharing your life? So following up is 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 um, reflective of someone who can be relational, be connected. So I would imagine also in this verbal is like if someone pries too much and crosses boundaries into what you know not ready to share, but you have to tell me right. or something like that. Right, absolutely. Right. So if someone isn't ready to share something about themselves or their family or um, something personal, private to them, but they would be once the relationship feels safer or safe enough, um, that's a very reasonable thing to to want to wait and to ask to wait. If someone is pushing or coercing or putting pressure that it should be shared now, if they have a hard time tolerating that that weight, that's something to be to pay attention to. Everyone has a right to be able to say, I'm not ready to share that. It's a great question. I'm not ready to share it today. Totally. And I also feel like that sometimes there was the advice of like, help them help the other person come out of their shell or help them say what they want to or what they know that they should. I think that's really where it comes to balancing. So how would you be able to help them a little bit become more comfortable, but not crossing boundaries? I think reassuring them that it's okay for you to say no right now. And, and I'm here when you're ready to share that. I think just that reassurance creates an environment of safety that makes it easier for the other person to step into when they are ready. It might even help speed that up. Now, I think that's important. Like when you feel safe, then you could actually share it. Absolutely. You might want, you might feel more comfortable to share it. More but Just more. because you said it's okay to say no, doesn't mean that they will open up right then. Right. They don't use it as a manipulative ploy. Like I've said it. <laughs> right. Right. But if you continue to date and you're liking each other, it's moving forward, then that would be a quality that will um, help develop a sense of safety emotionally to be able to be vulnerable and share things that feel private to, to you. Okay. So Maybe that's point. verbal safety. Then the next category. Physical. Let's go with that one. So physical boundaries are important really at every stage of a relationship. In dating, people want to proximity, not touching at all, of course. And when people, sometimes people violate that, you know, and, and sometimes even use religion to justify it It's or whatever justification. Sometimes people are, I've, I worked with someone who was engaged and they, it was late at night, it was dark, and he touched her hair, and touched her jacket. She was very uncomfortable with it, but didn't really know how to say that it wasn't okay for her or comfortable for her while he was saying that it is okay and it's what, whatever the reason was. And so we really wanna to try to help people find their voice and be able to say, I'm really not comfortable with this right now. And, and to see what the reaction is when someone is able to have that no to have a no, it's a really important moment. So we see that in dating, but you also, I've met it for, in some of the couples that I ended up talking to, and I think what you also described is, was they were engaged. So that sort of like the commitment was there. And then he or she, and I'm not saying it was one gender over the other, we're just, you and I are female, so we're just going to speak from that gender, but it goes either, it could go either way. Absolutely. And, and he just says, but we're gonna be married soon anyway. Right. And that sometimes happens more when they're engaged, more, yeah, more than when it's dating. But even when it's in during dating, it's just they have to listen and take the cues. Now we're not talking about halacha here or what each couple does or doesn't do. Like when that's not our our purview right now. But if if one of them is uncomfortable with it, the other one can't or shouldn't be saying, "But we'll be married soon anyway." That's right. So what you just said, that if anyone, if someone isn't comfortable with it, that's the default. That's the common denominator. That, that has to be the common denominator. That has to be what's respected. If someone is uncomfortable, no, no one should be sold out to have to do something that they are uncomfortable with. Right? That should so be respected. So putting on your other hat, can we say that if somebody is not allowing those boundaries, could it say could it indicate some sort of addiction or is it not necessarily yes no 
possibly? Possibly, not necessarily. It's right. So there are different signs that we would look for to be able to diagnose sexual addiction. There are different things that we would look for. Not one, not only one thing. One of the characteristics would be violating physical boundaries this way. That would be something concerning. If someone is is not respecting the value um, or the sometimes there's a history of abuse for someone and they're uncomfortable physically altogether, that could show up in marriage, that would show up later eventually. But all of that has to be really respected, like very sacredly. But that is one of it's one of the features. It's not the only. If someone is in terms of looking out for any kind of addiction or sexual something, another feature could be some people can look out for when jokes are made that are sexualized, a lot of sexualized jokes or sexualizing people or topics like conversations or things that are neutral when they become made into something sexual, that's something to pay attention to. And I think it also feel it's about any kind of addiction, but I also feel like it fall, can fall under the category of boundaries if it's really not his or her style. Also, so just don't go there. And again, we don't have to make this relationship work. We're dating, so we don't have to make it work. So if it's right. kind of uncomfortable, regardless of it, whether it's a boundary or not, if you just don't like the type of jokes, then you just don't have to you know, really find it offensive. And you say so, and he, she continues with that. Is it a boundary or is it, a, you just don't like that personality? It's either one and you don't have to continue with that. Yeah, e either one, but it's usually a sign of something, right? If someone is thinking in those terms that they're joking, you know, that, that regular life experiences are being turned into sexualized jokes or innuendos, it says something about how someone is thinking. It's not only about sexualizing, it could be anything, right? How we see things is how we frame things. So it says something about, about, about people. How so if you see that. that in yourself, then just know to work with it, analyze it, speak to somebody. What is going, what, why do I do that? I mean, most likely you kind of know really, if you were really honest, that that's something that's going on for you. But I think that what we're saying here in this conversation is not only the one that has boundaries that are crossed but the one who is crossing the boundaries, if you kind of hear yourself in some of these examples, it's worth delving down further to see what's going on for you. It absolutely is worth it. It's harder for the person who's doing it to identify, oh, this is a this is something that's a problem. And until it becomes a problem, people don't tend to see it as a problem. To totally. But I think that if you do recognize in yourself, you can just kind of work through it or see yes. and may not be something you can do yourself but if you want to be honest if you keep getting no's right and you get to a certain type of you know certain part of the dating and you start doing these things maybe there's something about you and not necessarily the person yeah can and handle if, you and if someone is able to see that pattern in themselves and, and want to do something about it there's absolutely help to get out to get there that can that can move away from being flooded in those kinds of thoughts those that way of thinking absolutely so we talked about verbal and we talked about physical boundaries. Okay. Let's emotional. Okay. So emotional is really showing respect. Be, we've touched on it, being able to say no and be respected for the no. A lot of people, often women, not only, but feel pressure to have to accommodate. And uh, but both people tend to want to be liked and bend over backwards to try to present a certain way. The risk of that, nothing wrong with it, but the risk of that is losing yourself and not being who authentic to who you are. Well, if you're being authentic and you do have a no, like we talked about before, it's important to see what the reaction is on the other side. Can someone be respectful of, of you having a no? I don't want to go to that restaurant or I don't want to go out to this type of activity or I'm not comfortable going out again this week or whatever right? How is that received? Is it respected? Is it honored? So is that something to do with just to say a no, just to see how it's received? I mean, something that's reasonable to say a no on just to see how it's received, even if you are pretty like laid back and let a lot of things go, just to experience it. What are your thoughts? I think that as you spend time with someone, things naturally come up right? Because two different people will ultimately have two different opinions and wants and wishes. 
at some point. So often it doesn't usually have to be made up or contrived that way. But if you're so laid back and you go with the flow and nothing, maybe, maybe you would imagine um, finding what do I want to do tonight? Or how do I feel about going out to this certain place? Or would it be nice for me to go out again this week and, and see if there's a true no somewhere? It's really important to find that inside ourselves. The be what do I want instead of deferring? Okay, so verbal, physical, emotional. Then we have the next one, relational. So the next one, okay, relational. So how people respond to conflict is important to explore when you're dating. How do people respond to conflict? Anger. Are people, um, is it harsh when they get angry? Is there gaslighting? That's something we can talk about. Yeah, I do want to unpack gaslighting, but let's finish this and then we'll go into the gaslighting. Okay. Can both people look at themselves and, cons and consider their contribution to the conflict? Right. That's an important aspect of, of um, conflict resolution and how anger gets expressed between two people. How do people respond? How does one person, both people respond to things that are important to the other? Family friends, hobbies, interests? Um, are they supportive? Are they excited to hear about it? You know, I may not be interested at all in it, but if you are, am I interested to hear about you, right? And do I want to tell me how it went, you know, your activity today? Or So um, taking an interest in, in the other person's um, life, including people in their life, is a, is a very relational, so it's an important way of getting... Um, connected to someone and and who and their life all about their life that that bu builds relationship it's important the question of the boundary would be getting to pry again prying in too much or the other way of just totally not being interested at all also judgmental and critical or disapproving like putting it down so here comes a question, and then I do want to get to the gaslighting because I think it's an important piece. But yeah. if they talk about other people in judgmental ways, not not the relationship between the two of the two daters, but if they talk about other people, is that something to be to look at? Definitely, definitely. You can assume if someone is talking about other people, and whether they know them or don't know them, in a critical, judgmental way, that that will turn against you too. Because you're not going to be perfect it? all the way through. What? Because we're not going to be perfect all the way through 70, 80 years. Perfect. Right. Because it also shows, it's it's not just the criticism, it's showing you, you're learning how people think. It's like what we were talking about earlier. This is how pe if people think in critical ways, that will bleed into probably all areas. And it's all on a spectrum. So it's not necessarily a fatal flaw, but it's something to just be aware of and alert to. Put it into the whole, the whole person of what of who he is who she is right because no one's perfect right but see how it feels to you and so and some people can tolerate a little bit more anger than somebody than someone else right so there's no there's no even right level of what's considered what's considered wrong rage may be intolerable to almost everybody but different levels of anger may be familiar and co comfortable enough and it can work I think you're right. I agree. I agree with you. And and what's the what's the um, resiliency from that? Right? How how fast do people come back? That's an important part after after anger, after a disagreement or a fight. How do we come back? And how fast? It shouldn't take long. When it takes a long time, it starts to get punishing. We don't want to do that. And the apology, or the right. acknowledgement, exactly. And the level of the apology. I'm not not that I'm sorry if I hurt you. Right. Sorry, we talked about respect. I think that sorry if I hurt you doesn't sound very respectful. No, no, it's very, uh, it's not really an apology. Not really. It has the case. word sorry, but it's not an apology. I think the intent behind it, I'm sorry if I hurt you, doesn't have the intent of apology. It has the okay. word. Exactly. Not the intent. And, and, that, and that leads us to just mention that if you're hurt, I don't have to agree if you're hurt. If you're telling me you're hurt, you're hurt. And I can just be sensitive to that. It doesn't have to be an if, right? No one has to evaluate whether I feel hurt or not. If I'm hurt, that's it, right? Then how do we bring sensitivity to each other just in the hurt without having to agree with it? And not dismissing it. Well, even if I wasn't the one who hurt, but to say like somebody else hurt you, like, oh, that's nothing. Why, why do you care that that person said that? Like, what do you care? 
And I think that that's also dis uh, disrespectful, right. dismissing of whatever is going on for them. It's like right. sort of validating. It's the opposite. It's invalidating. Yeah, I was yeah. so big into validating, which is, I think, very important. But what does invalidating sound like? And what does it feel like to you when someone invalidates? Yeah. Yeah, really important to pay attention to. So we started talking about the word gaslighting. So let's first define it and then what might that look like in dating? Okay. Um, so gaslighting is a mechanism. It's a behavior where someone puts the blame back on somebody else for something that they didn't do. So I use the example, if I step on your toe and you say, ouch, and I blame you for saying, ouch, that's a gaslight, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not taking responsibility for having stepped on you and, and knowing that I hurt you, I'm blaming you for your reaction to it. Hmm. I also thought that gaslighting was like sort of making, if something wasn't even there and saying that you did do it or something was there and saying that it didn't happen. Also, also, right. Right. So these are ways, these are things that when they happen, make people feel like they're crazy. It's a bit of a crazy making kind of a thing to do. People wind up saying, but I didn't do that. Like when they're blamed for something that wasn't even there or, or they're blamed for having a reaction to something that was there. So, and I mean, that happens sometimes in some of these in marriages, but when we're dating, it doesn't happen as much, but you could start because there's just simply not as many years of time. So after when you're in a marriage for a while, hopefully no one, no one listening will ever have experienced this, but it takes a while for you to start seeing the patterns of it. But when you're dating, you may not, there's not a, not a lot of it. So what are we looking for in dating that would hint to beginning of a pattern of gaslighting? In any kind of a disagreement or conflict or difference of opinion, if, if you're being put down for it, if you're being blamed for causing all of it, if you were told that you did something that you really didn't do, or you were told you, you said something that you know you didn't say, but now you're not sure because you're being told you did, those are sy symptoms and signals of gaslighting. So it, it would likely show up more in conflict and intention. At least in, in dating, it would show up there. Also. Um, no, but I think in a marriage, it can show up at any point. I mean, the original gaslighting was when he just shut the gas and then tell, told her the light didn't go off. Right. And that was the original story. Right. Hence the word. Yeah. Right. Similarly, there's also the concept of love bombing, which I also think is a crossing of a boundary. So let's talk to that a little bit. Right. So also in extremes. Right. So love bombing is when it feels, it can feel so delicious. It can feel so good because you're being told how wonderful you are and how amazing you are. You're being very adored and admired and you're being promised the world. You might be given an amazing date, a big over the top grand, and it can feel really fun and good and flattering, but it's not a sustainable kind of a way of relating. So it's a big it's a big love bomb. And usually after that, there's some kinds of a with, withdrawal or something that is dis winds up feeling disappointing to the person who was love, love bombed. Lo Our dating is shorter. So like you may, like if we go only six weeks, you can actually be love bombed six weeks. It's not as if the withdrawal will happen necessarily in that six, eight weeks. Yeah. But I think that the whole idea of what you stress a few times is that extreme or that whether it's like just so over the top, unless someone's really, 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 really can sustain that forever. Or do you even want them to sustain that forever? Do you really want helicopter rides every Wednesday? You right. Know, like, <laughs> right. So it's really the extreme, the over the top. And what I've also found sometimes is when people do those big extremes, you feel indebted to whatever it is yeah. that they might ask for separately or later. Yeah. Yeah. You can feel indebted, like you owe them something. And that might not be comfortable. It's it's important to also know, right? We have to we have to learn like when is this out of balance and when is it, you know, a grand gesture could be something that isn't what we're talking about in a concerning right. way. It could be something really lovely and and enjoyable. But all in the patterns, I think we want to look for patterns. Anything in a one-off isn't a pattern. So if something is in a pattern and it's um it's troubling in any way whether it's a love bomb or a gaslight or any of the features we're talking about tonight 
that's what we want to look for in dating. And that, that goes to a whole other topic of don't try to figure it out by yourself. At least talk it out, journal yeah. it out, talk to somebody. Just even if the date seems wonderful and grand, it's just worth talking it out. It's a huge decision. And sometimes we ourselves are blindsided or just so excited that we're not really thinking it through. So I just, I always encourage people to talk to somebody, probably not your best friend, of your, especially one of the younger daters, because they just don't have many years of life experience of being able to decipher what's going on. To talk to somebody, whether it's your parents or mashpia or mentor or coach, therapist, just don't try to figure this all out on your own. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, especially yeah. if there's some inkling that you're not sure. Or if it just hits an extreme one way or the other, and it may be totally neutral, it may be fine, but if it's hitting an extreme, it's worth investigating with somebody with a little bit more experience. I, yeah, absolutely. And I think people have to, um, not as, as a generalization, we're not really good at listening to our bodies. Our bodies will talk to us. If something isn't feeling right, we'll generally somewhere feel it in our body, some kind of a tightness or reaction. We often dismiss it, but we can get better at paying attention to these reactions that we have inside. And that that's a really good guide not to dismiss those. So, so, so sometimes people dismiss them because they don't want to break up or they like it enough or they just want to get married or a lot of reasons to forge ahead and push through. But if people can pay attention and then bring it somewhere to make sense of it, what does this mean? Is there anything that I need to do or talk about about this? Or bring it back into the relationship or talk about it together and see the right. reaction. Absolutely. It's sort of, you have that, we were saying, should we try to see if we should say a no or something? Here, you, if you have some sort of icky feeling about something, bring it, if you choose to bring it back into the conversation, if you choose to even go back into the conversation. Right. You could say no altogether, but if, you, if you're choosing to be in the relationship, then talk about it. Which, which could potentially deepen the relationship, right? To bring in that kind of authenticity, the honesty, it, it can be really enriching. Well, you'd want that in a marriage if you had actually different perspectives and there's right. definitely going to be different perspectives at some point in the marriage probably within the first month we first week you'll have some so try it out and see how you can actually disagree or share your different perspectives can yeah. your voice be heard right I, mean, I always encourage people to actually have some sort of uncomfortable conversation when they're dating just not only for the information but for that whole feeling and experiencing what it's like to have a difference of opinion, difference yeah. of perspective. Yeah, yeah, to be in that dynamic, to see how it unfolds. Can there be, is is there, are they, are you both maintaining respect? Are your ears open to listening to the difference of opinions or thoughts? Can difference be tolerated well and received well, accepted? Really important. And similarly, can you, do you feel comfortable enough to bring it up altogether? Right. And if not, why not, right? Is it is that someone's, um, their own history or is it something about the relationship where there's fear of bringing something up? All just questions, all just curiosity. And so the dating is, I think it's a curiosity game. Yeah. Not only the information, it's all about the relationship. And that's why we're talking about boundaries and respect because we're trying to have an experience in the dating, not only the information. Right, I agree with you. So we covered four different, the, the four of the five. Okay. So we're left with behavioral. Okay. Yeah. So behavioral boundaries are, again, everything kind of intertwines as well. Um, you want to look for the actions. Are people consistent with their actions? Do they say what they're going to do? Do they do what they're going to say they're going to do? Are they following through on the word? Are, are they saying that they're going to do something and do they follow through? If it's, um, are they on time? If they say they're going to be at, there at a certain time, are, are they showing up on time? Are they chronically late? Um, if they say they're going to call or if they say they're going to, whatever, just following through on the word. Um, agreeing to something that a person doesn't want to do. Let's say a couple agrees on something that they are going to do together. If it's in the dating or if it's in the engagement, they're planning the wedding at any stage, but one person does what they have a difference of opinion. They come to an agreement, but one person does what they want to do anyway. Right. Right. It happens. It happens. 
and it it really um, intensifies later on. It's definitely going to keep happening um, unless you can really work through it. But at this point, especially when you're dating, engage is a little bit more tricky. But when you're dating, you have to decide what you want to do about that. Yeah. Do you want to be in a relationship like that, or can you talk it through right now and talk about how you don't like that, or you want some a change and see that there is actually a change. You would want to see if that could be, if there could be a change, because it, I, it, I work with people where this comes up and from dating to engagement into marriage, and it just intensifies. So the person who's left feeling like, well, we talked about this. We agreed on this. Why are you doing what you want to do anyway? We didn't discuss that. It feels it, it's very excluding, unilateral, it could be very lonely to be on the other side of that. And sometimes it could be damaging depending what it is. That's what I'm just thinking about. If you spend, we agree that we would only spend a thousand dollars and you spend $5,000, that's just, that could be financially damaging. Right. And then the other one's left holding, or both of them are left holding the problem, but I had, I didn't do it. Right. Right. So the financial betrayal in that way. Yeah. Oh, it's financial betrayal, but it's also like taking care of the kids and all the different, just different things about, you know, like. Yeah, you, know, you said you'd be home and here's three days later or whatever, vacation or whatever. Or you brought them three days earlier than you said. Right. <laughs> and, you know, like you said, you would take the kids for a week. And so I planned my whole, and then you just brought them home two days earlier. Like, what is, what is that? Right. So in dating, it could be, it could be something, you know, much more s simple in, in that stage of dating. Like, where do we, if people are going out to a restaurant, it could be, we decided on doing dairy, but now we're going to some very expensive meat restaurant, right? It could be something like that, but there is a flavor to, to notice like what happened or why was there a change when we discussed what we both wanted to do? It's just a flavor mm -hmm. to see where it goes. We spoke about, you mentioned about being late. Is that really crossing a boundary? Because there are some people who are really always late. That's just how they operate. Right. I think it is a boundary issue, right? If someone is, if we agree on a time and one person is waiting and waiting, it's their time and the other person is late and running late and chronically late. Again, it, I don't think it has to be a, a fatal flaw to the relationship, but it, it isn't respecting the other person's time as they're sitting and waiting for you. Right. And marriages work that way. There are a, a number of people who are late, but it's, again, it's yeah. something to consider. Again, we're not saying that if someone's late, that they're not marriageable right but yeah. if you are chronically late let the other person know that so that they could just work it through in their head as they're deciding right so that would be a respectful solution to that lateness right so if someone knows that they run late and they're running late to to communicate that right just like I, i'm thinking of you so that you're not waiting for me i'm gonna let you know i'm running late i just kind of broaden that instead of just keeping it to yourself and letting the person wait. Right. Like right. There are people who know that, that five o'clock is never five o'clock for them. Right. So, and at five o'clock, they didn't even leave the house. They didn't even take a shower yet. Right. So like, and the other person stood waiting. So they just, I don't know. I mean, I'm not one of those people, so I don't understand how that works. <laughs> uh, but if five o'clock is five, not five o'clock, five o'clock is really seven o'clock, then just say seven o'clock. But again, it, it must work for a number of people because that's what they do. But you yeah. could also say that's what you do. In the same way that we would say that I'm not the neatest person, you will say I'm not prompt. It's not, like you said, it's not a fatal flaw. It's just right. letting somebody know. And then already it's more respectful, that this is just how I am. Yeah. And how can we work around our differences in a respectful way? And this is one of, this is an example of that, right? If one person just runs late, how can we work around that in a respectful way? Or like, I think that's like the kind about. of conversation that can really bring people together. Like we figured yeah. something out. Yeah. 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 And that's the relational. Come back to the relational piece. Yeah. I think it's super important not to not say these things. I think it's some level of betrayal. I don't think it's fatalistic, but I think that if you know that you're always late, I think it's important to bring that in. And similarly, if you're really not very neat, I think it's just worth saying i don't think that i don't think that it's not marriageable except for the person who's really really likes things to be really really orderly and like there are spices that were lined up so someone who's not neat is really going to it's going to be a clash every single day right. <laughs> but 
I think that's just part of the respect. This is who I am, like sharing the the wholeness of who I am, not just hiding things. That's right. That's right. So letting people be in their own humanity. Everyone has it. We're all in our own humanity and how, and, and we have to have some give like a rubber band. Like we have to give, have some give for the other person to be different from us and, and that, you know, and, and we're different from them. And anyone you marry will be different from you in some ways. Right. I also think it makes life more interesting. Yeah. If you only, if you both liked only hiking and only water sports, then you wouldn't be open to seeing you know, travel and you know cultural travel. I think we would just expand our horizons by being different. Mm, such a nice way to look at that. The world is so there's so many different ways, and there's some maybe there's some value. I'm very on time, but maybe there's some value of me, me chilling out a little bit. Like I don't have to be there like nine oh one. It could be the nine oh five, mm -hmm. but you know maybe there is something. Right. But that whole, that whole idea of that like, you don't have to be you're not going to find someone exactly like you in all the different aspects of who you are. Right. On the other hand, not to say that oh well, I can surprise them. This thing that they're not, you know this is the thing that we're not going to be the same because there's enough things that are going to show up anyway that you're not the same. The big things that you already know I think is worth sharing up front. Yeah. 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 And, and, and like you said, it, it can lead to a more enriched and deep, honest connection. You'll have that conversation later. If you do get married, you'll have to have that conversation at some point pretty soon. Exactly. Especially right. lateness, you'll have that pretty soon, like Sheva Bar. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so have the conversation before and actually have that experience and have it worked out to some degree before. And you also, I feel, I think it's respectful for people to know more or less what they're getting into. Yeah, I think that's great as much as you can. And then how that gets resolved, how that gets navigated, negotiated is that process is really important to, to, to look at how both people can contribute to the solution respectfully. And that's not right. like, this is what it has, this is what it has to be. If you're going to marry me, this is what it has to be. Or yeah, not doing very it. collaborative, right? Right. I mean, once there may be one or two things that if you will marry me, you'll have to live in Montreal because that's where my business is. I mean, with Shaduchim, maybe that should have come up before because we do all that research before, but nonetheless, there may be some things, and you have, then the other person can decide what they want to do about that, but have a conversation. Yeah. But not absolutely. When we get married, this is what you're going to have to do. That's, I mean, that's an obvious bound, crossing of a boundary. There's an obvious controlling, but there's different levels of that. And again, it has to feel comfortable. And you have, I feel like we said earlier that you have to be able to say, no, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. And negotiate, compromise, come up with a, a, a new solution, a new idea. Yeah. And get, and get, bounce it off of someone who can be helpful if it's confusing. Like you were <laughs> saying earlier, it's very important to do that. I think to even bring someone into the conversation, not only is myself going home and reflecting with somebody, but maybe in business and in all kinds of relationships, sometimes someone can come up with a third creative idea that can work out wonderfully. If everything makes so much sense, except for this one thing, it might be worth bringing someone else into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I mean, the two young daters or even older daters, they're just two people who each of them want what they want. And just many times there's a third creative idea. Right. Right. I see uh, people come to me when they're dating they're, they're before they get engaged and where, where issues have already come up a bit and they're figuring out how to um, engage those around those issues in, in respectful relational ways. It, it's wonderful to bring someone into it, whoever it is, someone that you can both respect. To help. So I do the same thing when I do my dating coaching. Sometimes I have some couples come, whether they come together and or they come separately in phone calls, really depending on what the situation is. I do like to have them eventually come together. You know, yeah. you know he says, she said, talking about the other. Right. But sometimes it starts off that way. And sometimes you can just share a different perspective and then all of a sudden it just clicks for them. They don't really have to come to me as a conversation. But, yeah. but try just saying no because you don't know how to navigate it. And everything makes so much sense except for this one thing that you don't know how to navigate or you're not comfortable navigating. I think it's worth exploring it in a different way. Agree. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's and really it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a boundary crossed. 
just because we're using the word boundaries. I think that it's worth exploring. Is it really a boundary cross? Or because sometimes people throw the word around a lot. But it, it's all in patterns, right? It's it's not one piece, one time, one. It it, it, it really would be, we're looking for, when, in this conversation, when we're looking at, at boundary failure and we're alarmed by it, it's in patterns. Um, and it's really this all on a spectrum. So we want to be able to learn what am I looking out for? What is alarming? What's the middle range that's healthy? And where is something now imbalanced? And feel your body, feel what's what, how something lands on you. Feel if you're feeling like that feeling of, um, oh, I didn't like that, but I'm just moving on and going on with the date. Just, but catch that moment. See what that, what, why that happened. And I think when you say catch that moment, even in that moment, maybe bring it up rather than you know, oh. think about it afterwards. And of course, if you thought about it afterwards and you have to reflect on it, you can decide what you want to do about that. But if you just choose to continue dating, I think it's worth bringing it up, not just inferring what that might mean, or I'm just going to like pretend that didn't happen. But really, ideally, is as it comes up, if you actually feel it during the date, bring it up. That would be, if, if that's great. That's the best moment is to do it in the moment. Sometimes, not always, sometimes timing needs to be different but that would be wonderful when people can find that like that courage to to say something that might feel uncomfortable to say it anyway in the moment and call it out and then see it's keep an eye and see what does the other person do with that and sometimes like one of the most romantic words is i didn't realize i mean i feel that's one of the most romantic words like i didn't realize i was so hurtful or or, was, or across yeah. the boundary or was too that was a sensitive area for you especially in dating and early marriage, when you don't need don't know each other very well, you don't know what is a sensitive area because like maybe for your sister or brother, it's not a sensitive area, but for this new person, it is. So you could have made a mistake. And similarly, someone could have made a mistake and it doesn't mean that it's a bad person. It's just yeah, in their context, it was fine, but in your context, it's not. So right. that's why we're looking for patterns and not just one-offs, like you said. Right patterns and then after we've discussed it and after now we get to know each other right now this is a sensitivity of mine right so now what do you do with that and what do I do with yours so as as two people get to know each other it's the follow-through what happens after that the first offense right is like it, it could be oh I didn't mean to step on a landline but if I did now I need to be aware of that right so how do people bring sensitivity once they know and then I think sometimes a second time, it also, as I was still learning, like it's just because you said it once doesn't mean that they could no longer flip the switch and remember not to say that ever again, or extrapolate that if it was sensitive in this area, that must mean I shouldn't say this either, because it's a new to, it, the whole concept may be new to them. So I think that giving them space to learn who you are, yeah, or giving yourself space to learn who the other person is, like uh, just as a, as a relationship develops, there will be mistakes all throughout the 70, 80, 90 years of the marriage. Yeah. And definitely in the beginning. So that could happen in the dating. And just because they didn't get it right doesn't mean that this is not, this can't be a really wonderful relationship. Right. You're right. It can be a wonderful relationship. And, and we all make mistakes with people, with each other. So it does, that does happen. We just want to listen for, we want to continue to grow together. Can we grow together? Is this a person that I can grow with? I can grow with me, right? We so want to ask ourselves. Does that mean that you're looking for at least some examples in the dating that we actually grew together or we figure something out together or we learn from each other or you have an exa of some example of some influence that they took from you and you took from them? Do you actually see yourself as a relationship in the dating? Yeah, I think that as the dating is happening and 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 you're getting to know each other, and you have your disagreements and you start to see differences and 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 some of them are very benign and some of them are might you might bump into conflict how are we how are we navigating through those those spots right are we growing together through them so it's not just about getting information like checklists i found out about his family i found out about what he wants right. to do i found out what her, her family like it's really paying attention really paying attention to the relationship and seeing that the relationship has actually moved the flow that it's moved, that there's more kind sensitivity and kindness, care, because now we're getting to know the person, right? And as I, as someone gets to know each other, as, as you get to know each other, do you feel a care that's starting to build for that person? It becomes more personal in that way. 
and a comfortability. Yeah. So what I'm saying specifically is like you've seen that the other person has taken your influence. Something has sifted in them. Not just that you're more that you're more comfortable because you spent more time together, but that you actually can work some, work something out together, or that you listen to him and he listens to you, and like you just get each other. Not of course not fully. Even in married thirty years, you don't fully know each other, and you also change throughout the years of the marriage. But that's a whole another conversation. I think that's right. important. But that actually is to see that you. Yeah, that you can work together that you so it's not just that you're more more and more comfortable but have some examples that you actually are working through something together yeah and have the confidence to be able that you can work through the bumps or the clanks right there's going to be they're going to be clanks oh and there will be yeah. the always so there's a mechanism right in the heart of a relationship that we know we can work it through whatever the content is the process can be productive, right? There's a difference between content and process. So the content will constantly change, but the process, if it can stay respectful and um, forward moving, constructive, that's that, that builds a lot of trust and safety in the relationship. And again, experiencing rather than talking about what would you do if we had a conflict, but actually experiencing it because it's very easy to have the right answer about what I would do hypothetically or what I even want to be doing if we yeah. had a conflict so having that experience of talking something through I think is super important yeah so get it so get it, maturing the relationship enough before um before committing taking the next level right whatever that means for different people and different communities but to get to know each other enough to know that that could happen is that and so I uh, similarly on this whole topic of respect I think that that idea of pushing somebody or trying to get them out of their comfort zone or like because they're holding back like or they keep their guard up or whatever language you want to use versus moving at the pace of the slower one and I think that at least from what I'm hearing here and from what, the way I, at least I hear it is you do move at the pace of the slower one that's a sign of respect yeah that's what I was I called earlier the common denominator Right, the slower person meets the need to of both, but the one that goes beyond that, that person isn't ready yet. So, yeah, to to respect that pace until that person feels like they can edge closer to be more in line. And then, I mean, there's a lot to consider. Like, are you the one who's moving too fast, or are they really, really guarded in something that they may, they maybe are? You're the one that's guarded and that's like really not moving forward. What can you do? What can you ask for the relationship, ask for in the relationship to help you become more comfortable? What can you look for? Or maybe it really is saying something about the relationship. It could be. It could be. So either what do you need to feel safer? Is there something missing that maybe that could bring in an address that might be workable or, or it just might not be a fit? Or it might be that you really have your guard up really, really too tall. Yeah. And that's a whole different thing. If you're finding that, if, again, if that's a pattern that you're finding in your dating, that you're getting to a certain point and then you're not sharing, then that's something to work on for yourself. Right. We do, there are some people who do this you know, uh, relationship after relationship and they could be older already and they're still getting only up to a certain point. And it may be that they're really finding people who are not safe, but it may also be that they're not feeling safe from their from within themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I have people come, they say they can't get past two dates or they can't get past three dates. That's it. Many of them, but that's it. So it's, they, they identify in themselves that it's hard to move into the next stage of more vulnerability. So I'm also finding that people will be able to get to five, six dates, but it's really as if it's the phase of the first dates. Yeah. They're not really sharing anything. They're just enjoying right. the city or they're enjoying the company or they're just, the evenings are not as lonely as staying at home. Right. But they're really not progressing in any relationship. And it can get very frustrating to the other person. Right. Right. The, the, the heartbeat of a, of a really close relationship is intimacy. In order to, to experience, to be in, intimate, connected in an in, you know, intimate way, you have to be vulnerable. Right. In order to be vulnerable, we need to feel safe. In order to feel safe, we have to have trust. Right. So these are the like layers that build up to what makes marriage the most intimate relationship we can have. Uh, but the trust is not always from the other person. It could be sometimes we just don't trust. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. And right. you're never going to find someone who's you're going to feel trustworthy if you yourself are just don't trust. Right. Right. So, uh, so, so the self-reflection, right. What do people, Again, what do people notice about themselves? If you find yourself in that pattern, it's not as if you say with, with the right person, I will open up. If you got into this like five, six times again to the same place, it's not as if you're going to find the right person who's going to help you open up. It may really be something about yourself and it's worth exploring that. Yeah, very and much so. That's a whole different conversation about what could it have is. happened earlier. But we're not, we'll save that for another conversation. <laughs> it is. And what you're also calling out is to be self-aware, right? For people to be honest with themselves, to say, I'm noticing that I have this struggle. Now, what do I want to do about it, if anything? But that self-awareness can only happen. It can, can only do it if you're willing to see your own patterns. Otherwise, people just stay stuck in, in them. But not to say the other person isn't safe. I don't, right. It's not always that the person isn't safe. That's right. So if that person is safe and this person is more guarded, and it might be that person doesn't feel that this is moving forward enough for them, they might be the one to. As to we wind them. down, we have a one question that came in. Okay, the question was, what could be holding people back? And there's so much to talk about that. We did do a talk with somebody about attachment theory, so there may be something in the attachment theory, uh, the, back in their attachment of like why they hold back, why they don't trust. And then you can find that on the previous episode. We did that with Freda Kaplan, so you can look for that. Uh, but do you want to say anything, like two minutes, like a minute on that? On why people, what holds people back? Right. From? From sharing, why are they so guarded? Why are they so not trusting? By the time people come into dating age, of dating age, we're, we're already formed people, right? So styles of relating you use the the term attachment um attachment theory so attachment is created from the time that we're born right and how, how we learn how to connect and how to be attached to people if in the best of scenarios we were attached within a safe nourishing um way safe way from the beginning of life and throughout in the best of scenarios and we have very safe attachments to people very low conflict people um, and relationships, people who have healthy attachment styles. But when there are, when there's an unsafety in people's upbringing in, in the home, something happens, some, something in, in earlier life, it doesn't usually start at 18, 19, 20 years old. Then people enter the dating time of their lives already with that, the, the guards up. And that will come into relationships naturally. Naturally, the system has a way of protecting itself from experience, though. It was born somewhere along the path of someone's life. And but that, it can be worked through. Again, for another, com another conversation. Yeah. But it's... Absolutely. Completely. Therapy is usually very helpful with that. And there are other many different ways to reach into our, oneself and look at what, what, what are the barriers or what are the protective parts that are keeping them from getting what they want. Okay, so we spoke a lot about boundaries. We spoke a lot about what these dating experience should be. Do you have any final thoughts before you share how people can reach you? This is all, this is a really important topic and I'm really, it's, it's wonderful that you're bringing attention to it. Relationships are really one of the most, if not the most important parts of our lives. It's the front and center, different relationships and marriage certainly at the front of the line, creating a life together and a family together with someone. So these are all really, this is where it, at the, where it starts. All of these are also very nuanced. Anything we said isn't in an absolute. It has to really be looked at as a global picture, but they're all different pieces to look at and consider. This has been so, I think it has been very well balanced. I think we got some comments. Thank you. How can anyone reach you and if you're available for new clients or new patients? I, yes, thank you. So I can be reached. I can be found on the on the internet. My website is ilanachasser.com. Uh, my email is on there, ilana at ilanachasser.com. Um, my phone number is there as well. So that would probably be the best way to to get me. I can also give you my phone number. It's 516-489-2652. All right. So thank you so much, Ilana. This has been thank really you, interesting. Laura. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you, and good night.
Good night. And you can find more from Shidduch You at our website at adayad.org. That's all A's, A-D-A-I-A-D.org on the Shidduch You page. Or you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have any questions, definitely reach out to us at info at adayad.org.